Hi everyone, thank you very much for uh, tuning in to this week's edition of the Recruitment Reality Podcast. That was a mouthful today for some reason. Must be end of my day, start of yours, Chase. Um, I'm really delighted to be joined by uh, an individual from over the pond. Totally new connection, but we do have some commonality that we both worked for the mighty Randstad uh, in the past. Um, so yeah, without further ado, I don't want to do like an introduction that will do you a disservice, Chase. So um, it'd be great if you could give us a quick background on you and obviously on Aim for Hire. Yeah, appreciate it. Um, always happy to do my own intro. Um, but yeah, uh, my name is Chase Cower. I was born and raised here in Austin, Texas. Um, grew up competitive basketball player, ended up playing basketball through college. So I'd, I'd probably argue that was my first job. And coming out of college, Austin's tech scene was exploding. So it made sense to jump in the tech world. So started my career with Ron Stav, where we have that mutual connection and uh, ended up finding my way to, to founding Aim for Hire, which were uh, what I would call a boutique recruiting agency for kind of hyper growth, emerging tech startups. Um, anywhere from like 20 to probably a thousand employee type software companies. Um, not all software, some are kind of tech enabled, but for the most part, you know, we're working with those uh, cutting edge SaaS companies that uh, are utilizing some pretty cool stuff, but obviously are also very selective in who they hire. And if they're early stage, they're even more picky and they can't offer the money that Facebook and Google and them can, can usually offer. So it's a, uh, it makes for a, a competitive job for sure. But um, all in all, we're about 15 employees. So we were founded four years ago um, and through COVID and recessions and bank failures, you know, we've, we've just been grinding and doing our thing. Amazing. So first question, how tall are you? <laughs> I'm actually only six foot, man. I, uh, com coming out of high school, I was like, I'm so wasted. I'm so wet. I'm six seven. Holy shit! For real? But yeah, but in the UK, like that means nothing. It means you've got a bad back when you're playing hockey. You know, it's like. Whereas if I was in the US, I would never have had to get a job. No, man. You six seven. You would have been a, a healthy uh, and happy athlete here in the states. I'd imagine, man. Um, between never mind well you had to grind at six foot that's incredible I had to grind man i think it's just like it, it's been in my dna i was always the tiniest guy playing you know on the court so i think it probably carried over to the business world where i have like a giant chip on my shoulder and i try to fight anything that tries to <laughs> mess with me so i think it's kind of um i guess it's paid off in some ways my business career but not as much my basketball career no, was uh, college where it ended? Uh, yes, I my my brother, who's our co-founder, played higher level college basketball, and he had some opportunities to play overseas, but decided to to start in the workforce here. Um, but we, one of our employees, actually uh, was drafted. I see the Chicago Bulls hat in the background. He was with their D, he was with their G League affiliate. Um, but he played there wow. for a couple of years and then joined us um, in sourcing and recruiting. So, so we definitely uh, have some some cool high level athletes on the team some too. Athlete type, yeah, yeah, nice, yeah, nice. Well, I'm uh, touch wood. I'm trialing for the Welsh over thirty fives field hockey team currently. So I wouldn't call it super high level, but uh, for for a man of over thirty five years old playing hockey, you know, it's probably the uh, you know, the best option that I could go for. Are so. there, are there advantages to being six, seven in hockey or is it? Yeah. Yeah. Reach, yeah. reach. Definitely. Uh, I don't have to run half as much as anybody else. Your strides so are just... <laughs> yeah. That's yeah, that's it. And I've just got big levers so I can hit it pretty hard and, and all of that kind of stuff. But, uh, but anyway, we digress. The, the reason I ask is I always have to stand in this doorway to prove that I'm six, seven to anybody that I kind of speak to, but there you go. I believe it. Um, <laughs> so we, we digress, like I say, really fantastic. Uh, like the fact that you've started it almost just before the pandemic and then made it all the way through. And I guess now hopefully you're starting to see, you know, SVB aside, you're starting to see 
um, some serious traction in Austin because it's, you know, a really dynamically changed metropolitan area, I guess. It'd be great to hear like what you've seen over that time and, and how, you know, your clients have kind of evolved. Yeah, I'd say in some ways, you know, you could complain that, you know, we started the company and then it less than a year into it, COVID happens. And then, you know, all the ups and downs, I think in the tech space, the last couple, you know, especially the last two or three years. Um, but, you know, for us being smaller, in fact, it, it was it was probably more of an advantage than to a Ronstadt or someone like that, where you're, it's so hard to pivot. It's so hard to be agile and adapt when you have that large of a company. Um, and for us, you know, it, we were able to kind of see the writing on the wall, especially when COVID happened and being like, you know, let's, let's shift our client base to companies that are in telehealth, um, or in the gaming space or in the broadcasting, you know, Netflix areas that like, we knew that if people were restricted to their homes, they'd still be utilizing those type of applications. Um, so for us, it, it was, it was somewhat easier to kind of just switch and just find one or two companies that are in, were in those spaces and, and kind of helped us grow, especially during that early period of COVID, obviously once people became more comfortable interviewing and hiring, uh, remotely, and obviously a lot of companies went the fully, fully remote route there. Um, I, I think we were just fine, but, but for a period it, it was, you know, things, when things are changing rapidly, which they tend to do in the tech space uh you know the ability to be to adapt and kind of you know cut on a corner and, and change directions uh really benefited us so i'll say that like it certainly has been tough but at the same time i think when you're a smaller firm uh you are able to kind of change direction uh, at a lot faster of a rate uh, as a big corporation mm -hmm. can so that's been a huge advantage austin to be frank like even with you know, COVID really stimulated a lot of relocation out of Silicon Valley um, and New York City and some of the really high cost of living places. And they were also struggling with their own kind of COVID restrictions and things like that. So a lot of people relocated to Texas and specifically Austin. So for us, it was how can we constantly be on top of the new people that are coming to town and, <laughs> and obviously getting them connected to the right jobs? I mean, that was the crazy thing is we had people relocating, you know, without a job yet. I mean, they were just like, we're going to Austin, pack the bags. And they were they were here without even a reload package or a company. Uh, it was pretty is a pretty interesting time period. Um, and it continues today. I mean, I mean, certainly there's probably a little more preparation. But I think when COVID happened, you know, there obviously was a kind of a, a panic uh, worldwide and rightfully so. Um, but we just saw an influx of people just coming to Austin. They already were coming in troves, but it kind of just expedited almost some of that growth. So, so being a part of that and recruiting, trying to recruit people before they get here and, you know, being the first one to represent that talent, like that's always a big challenge as any recruiter listening would understand. Um, and then, you know, Austin's a big, big, like VC, private equity, mostly VC backed environment where a lot of these tech startups rely on venture capital funding and support um, to grow. And, you know, to be frank, a lot of the VCs were pushing everybody to grow, grow, scale. And then obviously with, with kind of inflation and things like that, there became this major shift of like, we care less about growth now and we care more about profitability. Um, yeah. So is that the tech startups fall? Is that Facebook, you know, did they overhire? I mean, that's probably a discussion we could have for hours. Um, I don't know if it's necessarily fair when everyone's hiring, everyone's growing, you, you know, maybe your funders are also pushing you to grow and those are your goals. And then overnight, you know, your goals seemingly change. And, and that's just kind of from what I understand the way it works and, you know, the growth mindset shifted to profitability and being leaner and meaner. Um, so, I mean, it sucks to see all these tech layoffs, but at the same time, you know, I'd imagine there's a cyclicalness to to how the tech world's going to be. And we just went through a period where there really weren't any layoffs. It was just constant growth and growth and yeah. full benefits and high salaries yeah. and PTO, yeah. PTO and work from home. And yeah. yeah. I mean, that's it's um, like you say, we could debate why that happened uh, forever, but there was a lot of money that nobody knew what to do with. So they put it into VC funds who then put it into businesses who then 
didn't know what to do with it. And the best way to get rid of capital is to hire a load of people. Um, so, you know, that's kind of what happened. And then they suddenly realized that this can't happen forever. Um, and people got more conservative and spooked by a few things. And then all of a sudden they're going, oh, crap, got to get rid of some of these people. Yeah, it's, I think it's, it's a scary reality. And, and, and I'm not trying, you know, I think venture capital groups, you know, there are some, there are some obviously very high quality VC groups that do their due diligence. You know, they have boards, they're very involved with their board codes. And then you have others that, you know, maybe uh, were expanding too rapidly and weren't doing as much due diligence. I mean, I think it goes for probably any industry that you have the goods, the bads and the uglies of, of a certain area. But uh, mm. I think it is, it is a game in a lot of ways of, you know, you get all this money and you got to find a way to deploy it. Um, and then all of a sudden you're like, you know, shoot, I'm, I'm running out of money. Now what do I do? Um, so I think that's yeah. a scary reality. And, and I think a lot of companies are resistant to, to doing layoffs or, you know, reduction in forces. And, and I, I get it. Like, obviously I wouldn't never want to lay anybody off, but I, I think it's been interesting to see how some companies were very aggressive with doing that. And then others that were kind of very reluctant to do that. Yeah. Um, I think it's, uh, I don't know whether you've seen it in Austin, but well, let me ask the question, like with all of those layoffs, have you seen any individuals going, do you know what? I bet there's some brilliant companies outside of tech that I should, you know, that I should actually, because they've been, they've been struggling because they don't have fruit bowls and unlimited uh, PTO, you know, they've been struggling to hire yeah. And they haven't really changed that much as organizations. Um, they haven't been affected anywhere near as much as, you know, these sort of VC backed companies. So have you seen that with like the layoffs, people going, I'm going to move out of tech, actually? To be honest, I haven't seen a lot of it. Um, I have seen, you know, we work with some companies that are kind of like direct to consumer or they're like kind of CPG products where the product isn't a software product. Um, but they use technology to, to either have a strong e-commerce presence or kind of run different digital advertising. Uh, I've seen that area grow a bit. Uh, obviously, everybody during COVID being at home and shopping on Amazon all day, every day, I think that spurred uh, e-commerce uh, growth. But for the most part, we haven't seen a lot of that change. And frankly, software engineers, product managers, product designers, you know, people in those two verticals of skills, like haven't really had a, a hard time finding new jobs if they did get laid off. Yeah. Um, I, I can't say that they're getting the same compensation they got a year ago at, at Facebook um, or, you know, are working 30 hours a week and, and, you know, like you said, having the unlimited PTO. I don't think that's as prevalent. Um, but I, honestly, I think people just a lot of people might realize that just tech is so centric in almost any industry now um, that if you get that tech experience, like you're kind of almost locked into that space. I mean, you can certainly go explore elsewhere, but we haven't seen a lot of that, to be fair. Yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? I, ju I just think uh, the first thing to go is the packages. And the second thing to go is then, you know, how long have I actually been out of work now? And do I start looking at other things? So maybe that will come or maybe it won't. But um, but yeah, very interesting. What on the flip side, then, in terms of the clients that you're kind of dealing with, what what are they seeing as their like biggest challenges with this? You know, the swathes of uh, talent coming out of organizations, because maybe it's a different challenge to before where it used to be we can't find anybody now it's there's too many to get through who are the good ones you know what's the what are the challenges your clients are facing yeah i think you hit on it a bit in that you know i think companies are seeing better quality candidates just apply to their job postings um which is a first <laughs> uh i think in a lot of you know a lot of the companies we work with aren't household names yet um you know in most of the startups we work with are so early um, that, you know, they haven't run national TV ads or been, you know, on the banners at South by Southwest where people have like started to recognize what their logo is. Um, so I think, you know, part of the responsibility we have is like kind of representing that company in every way that we can, um, and really educating candidates sometimes. I mean, sometimes they, they really 
haven't heard of them at all and, and obviously have zero context of what that company does. Um, on the other hand, though, I, I'd say that since there are fewer companies hiring, especially the last three to six months, uh, you know, I think even just a simple LinkedIn job posting, I think is getting more engagement and probably more quality engagement than it has for the last eight years mm -hmm. that I've been in the space. Um, so companies have kind of had to adjust with like balancing their own influx of candidate flow. Um, and also, you know, trying to figure out, you know, what, what their true needs are. I think even companies that are in good cash position are just being incredibly picky right now. Um, so each and every hire is going to be pivotal because of the economy and the way their budget works. So I think in a lot of ways, these companies have kind of tried to shift their gears is like, we're not going to hire someone unless they're absolutely perfect. Uh, mm. Which, you know, I guess. Is, makes your life it makes, <laughs> makes, our, it makes our life shit, but it's at the same time, I mean, we were accustomed to it. I mean, we've been working with these smaller companies. They, they've always been super selective. So they, exactly. they got to fit the culture. Yeah. They got to fit the tech stack. They got to be willing to take less money and more stock options. They need to be risk adverse. They want to be part of a team that's disrupting. You know, we're accustomed to that, but I, I do think that's probably a shift for a lot of companies that aren't accustomed to recruiting, mm. um, you know, maybe more the Ronstadt model of high volume, um, you know, 10 resumes will produce two interviews, which will produce one offer. And therefore, yeah. let's get a hundred resumes over. Just, just send the resumes. Just send the resumes, man. The rest, the rest will take care of itself. <laughs> yeah, no, I, uh, I hear you completely. So tell me a bit about in terms of in, in your business then, um, sounds like you're, you know, you're really helping the startup organizations firstly understand what they need. Secondly, find that person in the marketplace. And then thirdly, actually whittle that down to like a, a quality shortlist of candidates. How, what's your process? How do you actually go about that? Yeah, we're pretty, we work very closely with, with the companies that we're representing, you know, for some of the reasons I already shared, as far as like, we don't want to just be passing their website to the candidate and, and the job description and just getting out of the way. Um, I think in a lot of ways that won't work if there's competition for that talent. Um, so our process is very, you know, more often than not, we're like the exclusive recruiting partner, or in a lot of ways, we might be the exclusive like talent flow for the companies we work with. Um, so it's just highly important that we're producing quality candidates, but we're also getting them enough quantity, um, that they're happy. Um, now, sometimes you earn, you build that relationship and you can only send a resume or two a week and they're happy because they know that you're still meeting with 50 people, yeah. but you're vetting them out. Yeah. Uh, when you have a new client, you know, it's always that honeymoon period of like trying to figure out, you know, where what's the right fit, what's the right culture, what are the right selling points. So, um, but for us, man, it, it's a lot of companies have gone back to this in office or hybrid model uh, here in Austin. So that's been a dramatic mm -hmm. shift because obviously fully remote wasn't even considered really a benefit. It was kind of just assumed there for a while. And now, yeah. you know, fully remote's kind of become a perk again and not all these companies are offering it. So uh, it's why is that? What's what? Why are they changing their tact? Because they can now. I think there's an argument to be made that there's some like there's some old schoolness to like having people in the office and and feeling like you can control them more effectively or you can have a better pulse on what's going on if you can see them and talk to them. Um, I, honestly, I don't think a lot of these companies were set up to be fully remote. And I think they liked the idea and they needed to grow, so they did. But I'm not so sure that the tools uh, or the forms of communication or the way they scheduled their days um, was working in a way where the executives and the investors felt confident that they were getting the most out of the team. Uh, mm. I think I, I had it firsthand, man. Our, our team's a lot of 20 and 30 year olds. And and there were days I was terrified they were sitting on Netflix all day, you know, hanging out. Um, <laughs> I'm sure there were days that they were doing and, that. And, yeah, um, and, and I think that's... You know, but for me, it was like, you know, setting, I think it's, it's easier probably in a recruiting firm because I, I can set metrics and goals. And I know that mm. if you're not hitting certain numbers, then it, then you're probably not working hard enough, um, or you need to make an adjustment. Whereas for a software engineer, for like a non-revenue generating metric or role, um, it might be harder to track 
Like, are they making the progress that you want? Um, I think software engineers really feel comfortable with a fully remote environment. And I'm, I'm honestly pretty surprised that companies are pushing that back to the office. Mm. Um, but you know, if they let the software engineers stay fully remote and everybody else has to go in, then you, then you start getting people complaining about equality and, you know, so I, it's such a hard one to tackle. Um, I empathize with any company having to decide on that. Um, but I, I think companies just struggle with the idea of not being able to see and meet and, and talk in person. I think they just, you know, whether that's old school or that's just a human interaction kind of thing. I think it's, I think, do you know what? I think it's just driven by who is running the business and what they like best. Yeah. Like, so I do, I personally find it hard uh, at times because I'm like, I have no idea what they've done today. <laughs> you know, and you're like, I feel so out of control of that. Whereas if they were in the office, I could at least see what they've done and, you know, make sure that they're happy. Right. Whereas that could go a whole day and, and they could be completely miserable and I wouldn't know about it. So it's all about over communicating in that world. But I think my business partner, Ewan, He's way more comfortable with remote and, you know, just just has the confidence that people do the job, et cetera, et cetera. And that's why, like, I've started going into an office, not even with my team, mm. just with a team around me so I can feel like, you know, there is something going on in an office. I know this might sound completely ludicrous, but it's it, I just think it's so driven by, like, the individual and what they that what they want and what works for them. And ever since I started doing that, I cared less about, or, or I worried less about, like the control of the people that worked for me. For sure. If that makes sense. For sure. And I think it was just my own anxiety of like knowing, personally, if I'm sat in an office like this on my own all day, yeah. all week, I'm not productive. I'm absolutely not productive. So I just assume that's the same for other people when it's not the case. And I, you're, I think that's so spot on. Of like the way you think like you assume that means less productivity but human beings are so you know obviously it takes all kinds and and i think that's maybe what's like you said maybe it's the ceo or the you know the executives are that way where it's like i can't get anything yeah. done unless i'm in an office so everybody else should be in the office and uh and i think that's the cookie cutter like you know mentality that maybe some people you know maybe it's education maybe it's just uh you know, one way and that's the way it's going to be. Um, but, I, yeah, I think for some people they thrive and others, maybe they don't. And, and that's why I think it's so difficult to really force people to go in the office and, or like, how can you find ways to maybe incentivize them to be there? Um, yeah. Well, that's the other thing is if you make an, if you make the office a place where people want to go, they'll go weirdly enough, weirdly you enough. Know. And it, so, for young for young people, I mean, especially if you started your career during COVID, you've kind of like, you've never even really been in an office environment. Like you've watched the show, The Office, yeah. probably all your, you know, childhood, <laughs> but you've never been in an office. And I, I almost kind of feel bad for those kind of people that now they're like, well, I just want to work from home. I'm like, I mean, you could use the social interaction, my friend. Like it, it could yeah. be good to, to get out and meet. It's not like the office. Right. That's... <laughs> Steve Carell's not there with a whiteboard talking about health and safety exactly. or whatever, you know. Exactly. Like, um, so, yeah, no, it's it, it, that's a particularly interesting thing. You don't know what you've got until it's gone and all of that stuff. So, um, but it works. It works both ways. And I think, look, the reality in our world, facilitating hires, obviously you do it in one way and we do it in another um, with software, is ultimately as long as you attract the right people, it doesn't really matter whether you're in the office or, or not in the office, you know, because people will now start to naturally select those companies. What you have to make sure is you don't miss sell, you know, whether somebody's going to be in the office or not, like if it's a hybrid and a proper hybrid and you have to be in once a week or three times a week, you have to tell the people that, uh, cause it's going to go down badly. And, and it's hard to tell sometimes. I mean, cause obviously you don't want to de-incentivize them from taking the offer and joining the team. And then, but then they find out a weekend. Yeah. What that expectation is. I, I think that's, I mean, the fully remote thing, I think either, you know, I think there are tools and ways that companies can make it more effective and probably more fluid. Um, but also to be fair, like everybody's living situation is different. Like you and I, I, 
I might live in an apartment where I have an office, I have a desk and I feel like I can work from home. Whereas someone else that might be, you know, have a roommate or might be, uh, you know, I don't know, maybe they don't have their own office. They have a bunch of kids running around. They can't focus. Um, you know, I, I think home office setups are, are also pretty important to that fully remote environment. Um, mm. You want someone to be productive. Um, you should probably ask the candidate about their home situation and, and maybe offer some way of kind of getting them a stand up desk or or getting them set up in a way that can make them you know more productive from home. Yeah. A laptop holder that sticks to the mirror in the toilet or something. That's the only place that it can get away. If from I get another place. Instagram ad of like some like floating shelf for to set your, your computer <laughs> up to work from home, I'm like gonna get anxiety. Uh, yeah, yeah, it's too much. But <laughs> no, I understand completely. Um okay, cool. And in terms of like um I guess from a from a sort of interviewing perspective have you seen have you seen much change in the way that you're actually screening candidates? Like obviously you started just before COVID and then COVID hit and you couldn't you couldn't interview any of them face to face. And now how's that all changing? And like how are you having that sort of multi, you know, multimedia almost way of interviewing people? Yeah, I I'd say that there are you know, especially the companies we work with, it, there are virtually no phone interviews anymore. Um, it's all video uh, communications. And even if it's like a 30 minute kind of like intro interview, uh, it's done via video. Um, and, you know, all these companies have their different teams, Zoom, Google Meets, whatever. Um, but I think I found that kind of interesting because it's just... Uh, mm-hmm obviously it's a pretty big shift. Like it wasn't uncommon to have a hiring manager call me and being like, this guy took this phone call, but he was clearly like driving or he was clearly like trying to do something else while doing the interview. And now it's pretty hard to get away with doing anything while interviewing if it's yeah. face-to-face and video. <laughs> and and that creates its own madness. I mean, you have some candidates that show up in like a tank top and a sideways you know, cap, and then you got others that that show up in a suit. So it's kind of like, you know, I don't know what the happy medium is there, but um, half a suit. Yeah, that's the happy medium. Yeah. <laughs> I like that, man. I think it's, it's fascinating to me, really. But, um, you know, I think it makes the interview process more effective. And I, I mean, I think we're all getting sick of doing zoom meetings all day, every day. But I do think the ability to see face to face and interact is more comfortable for some people. Um, and it does enable you to kind of maybe dig deeper than just a phone call. Um, Certainly in the early stages. So I, I think you really should do your best to meet a candidate face to face, you know, if you can, obviously if you're fully remote and you're hiring in the Philippines or yeah. something, it's, it's impossible. Right. But the telephone interview, I just think is completely pointless. Like, why would you bother? Um, you can test so much more with a video because you can test preparation, you can test professionalism, body language, you know, eye contact, like so many different things, right? Um, that you just couldn't have tested on a telephone interview. Right. Um, which just, to me, just, it just, you know, it's, it's like, personally, I think resumes should die as well. Like, they don't tell you n- enough about the person to do anything meaningful. I don't disagree with that, man. I feel like resumes are just there for, for filtering purposes of a company, uh, to filter either keywords or years of experience. And obviously there's a lot of AI being applied and I'm sure there'll be a lot more as far as, you know, but it used to drive me nuts. I mean, coming out of college, I had worked jobs while playing basketball, while going to school. Like I felt like I should start at a certain tier. So I'd apply to jobs that maybe required one or two years of professional experience, which where I didn't have any. Um, and maybe that was me just like, you know, thinking I was too cool for school, but I, I think it, it, I got denied by it just constantly. And I'm like, I just can't even get an interview. Um, mm. and it used to drive me nuts that companies would just go off years of experience versus what were the quality of the years of my experience? Um, I mean, I guess at that point, I didn't have any experience professionally. Yeah, but even that, but it's the quality of your potential. Like, just because you've got 20 years experience doesn't mean you're any good. Right. 
it just means you've got 20 years experience. Exactly. Um, and there's some people that have got 20 years experience that you would literally bet your house on them being successful. Exactly. But there's totally the flip side of that as well, right? I think that's, I think that's why I've really loved working with these smaller companies is, is they seemingly care more about the intangibles and like more about the, you know, the person that's willing to go into an environment and, and work, you know, kind of take the initiative, um, looking to disrupt and do something unique, looking to take ownership, looking to kind of, uh, take risk. Uh, I think company, you know, the companies we work with tend to be more flexible on those things. There's still kind of a year's required thing though. That's something we always push with, with the companies we're working with is like, we find someone with three years, but they've got, you know, it's three years with a hyper growth startup that, uh, you know, like with open AI, like three years at open AI should carry more weight yeah. than 10 years <laughs> at, you know, Dell computers. Like that's just in my mind, like that's something that companies need to fix, but you know, that they have a lot of AI and different systems built up that will vet those people out just based on kind of basic parameters. Um, yeah. so I'm with you, man. And most of our recruitment, I mean, we share LinkedIn profiles like virtually anytime we send candidates over, it's like we attach resumes, but I'm pretty sure most companies are looking at their LinkedIn and just seeing. Well, I just think the thing with the LinkedIn stuff is you can also see who they are as a personality, whether they interact with people, whether they post, yeah. you know, like a, a resume is a sales document, whereas your LinkedIn is you. That's your professional yeah. brand. Right. As a person. And I think some people and then, yeah, I think that's one caveat to that is like, I feel like some people treat it that way and others kind of like don't have it up to, and maybe they don't. I mean, some of these, some people, some of these engineers, especially like they're so sick. Of well, yeah, no, I'm talking, I guess I'm talking from more sales yeah. side. And if you're a salesperson and you're not posting on LinkedIn, you are for sure. Crap. For sure. You're rubbish. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> rubbish. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I don't disagree with that. Um, I think if I was recruiting recruiters on LinkedIn, uh, you know, yeah. I'd be looking for that. Oh my, you know, yeah. And, but so, software engineers, I guess, very different. Very different, but still, I mean, I mean, obviously they have GitHub and other other social media outlets that they tend to use more. Mm. Um, see, so, and, and usually through LinkedIn, you can kind of find them on those things and just see what their engagement's like. Um, but you know, uh, I think for a recruiter, especially, man, I mean, it's when you're recruiting on LinkedIn, LinkedIn recruiter, like your connections, first connection, secondary, third connections, like determine how, you know, your search results um, on LinkedIn yeah. recruiter. And if you have 50 connections, like you're going to have, you're, you're going to run a search that generates a hundred people for you. And it's going to generate a hundred thousand for me because I have got 20,000 connections and I've been doing this thing for a while. So it's like, that's the risk I think of a junior recruiter is like always focus on building those connections and building your network. Um, because I think it will have long-term benefits. Yeah. ABC always be connected. Always be connected. It's the new world. <laughs> I love that. Um, cool. Well, look, look, it's probably a good time to wrap up. Thanks for the, um, for the feedback and, and insights. There's, I always ask for one last bit of advice. Like if you were to give your clients, you know, the hiring managers within these startups uh, or the founders, any advice at the moment for, you know, finding the right people and keeping them, what would, what would the advice be that you gave to mm. them? I think retention, retention was so difficult there for a while retaining the top talent that you acquired. I think now it, it may be a little more focused on, you know, you're finding the right pieces. I, I think my advice to hiring managers is, is don't, don't just post the same job. You know, if you need to add a software engineer, you need to add a salesperson or a marketing person to the team. I, I don't just post a generic JD and have like a generic interview process set up. Like I, I would really value since each hire you're valuing right now in this economy, like I would evaluate your current team and really determine like, do you need that star studded go getter? Or do you need someone that's going to be a role player and is going to do the dirty work? Or do you need somebody that's going to, you know, at basketball analogy, like, or do you need another Michael Jordan on your team? Or do you need a, a utility player, Scotty Pippen, a Scotty Pippen, or do you need a Dennis Rodman? He's going to do the dirty work and like, is, you know, yeah. or okay, Dennis. so instead of just trying to like, I think hire an A plus person, I think if you're building a team, especially if it's a small team, like 
I, I would look at your current team and kind of determine like what kind of player do you need, not just what resume is going to fit your team. Um, yeah, I mean, Scotty Pippen's actually a great analogy because nobody thought, everybody thought it was all Michael Jordan for a long time. And he obviously, Scotty Pippen wasn't getting paid a lot. And then all of a sudden he refuses to play and they start losing every game, exactly. right? Exactly. So the people that quite often are, you know, the ones that you don't expect to be absolute linchpins to the organization really are, right? So. Exactly. And I think there's a temptation with, you know, there's more talent on the market. So you want to go out and you want to hire all these people from Google or, you know, all these like people on paper that look amazing. I would just caution managers to not get you know, not be blown away by the amount of candidates you're getting the bright lines. and really just yeah, focus, also. like keep your core principles together of like, what does your team need and, and what's the best kind of person and experience you can get? I mean, I think you can be a little more picky now because there's more options. Um, but I, I, I don't like to see candidates sacrificing that all of a sudden they can get these people that come from the big tech Twitters and Googles and Netflixes and, and they just get carried away with that. And they don't think about what kind of effect that could have on their team. Yeah, absolutely. Great, great advice. Thanks, Chase. Yeah. Um, so look, really appreciate your time. If uh, somebody does want to get in contact with you and you know find out a little bit more about the business and maybe partner with you, what's the best way to get in touch? Oh, LinkedIn, man. Uh, I mean, you can check out our website. It's just aim the number four and then hire H-I-R-E. Um, but I'm on LinkedIn day and night as any recruiter probably is so that's always a good place to send me a connection invite and if you want to chat or looking for a job whatever it is always happy to help perfect well i'll put your uh, your linkedin link in our show notes mm -hmm. as they are known um but look thanks so much for coming on been a pleasure to uh, to both speak and meet you yeah, uh, all in one podcast um and look i wish you all the best uh to see how things how things evolve over the next 12 months. I mean, blimey, let's do it. what an evolution it's been. Already. Yeah, let's do it again, <laughs> man. I'm sure it'll be, it'll be a different world by then. Uh, hopefully yeah. chat GPT isn't just running these podcasts on its own, but uh, who knows? By then. Yeah, you never know. I'll be an avatar, but it, you know, as long as I'm getting the commission from it, I don't care. <laughs> um, I can be an avatar. So, so look, thanks very much. And thanks everybody for, listening please don't forget to uh, to click subscribe um and uh, if ever you need me obviously i'm always available on linkedin have a good rest of your day